On Saturday, we heard the news that uh, Felicien Kabuga had been arrested in an apartment in Paris. After 26 years on the run, in some cases not on the run, but just hiding in plain sight, um, reports having said that, you know, the individuals who were around him um, had lived with him for so long that they didn't even recognize who he was. Um, he's somebody who kept to himself. He was solitary in most cases. And then intelligence got whiff of the fact that he was in this particular um, apartment in this Paris suburb mm -hmm. and they arrested him. All right. Now, if you want to look at the history of this case, of this gentleman who is... Um, uh, famed, shall we say, for having led the entire Hamway, which then caused the onslaught of uh, um, thousands, millions in this case, of um, Tutsis and moderate Hutus in, in, in Rwanda. And also um, owned the Radio Television de Mille Collines. And this was one of the channels that was used to propagate a lot of hate uh, within Rwanda. So he was the one who was accused of doing these two things. Now, we know for a fact that in Tarahamwe uh, led uh, a lot of death, a lot of the slaughter and the butchering that we saw, a huge amount of the raping of women mm. um, through. So this is what we see now, that he was being looked for, he was being sought after because he gave the command. Uh, now with uh, Radio Milkolin, what it was is that he then used journalists and anchors to spread the message of hate uh, throughout. So these are the two major things that he was being looked for. Mm. Now, after the war broke out and millions of people had died, Kabuga fled Rwanda. And uh, the story is that he hid between Kenya and the Democratic Republic of Congo for a very long time. He was also in Switzerland and he was also in Belgium. But what they're saying now is that over the last 26 years, the longest time he spent was in Kenya, DRC, and now where he was finally caught in France. There was a lot of push and pull between the Rwandese authorities and the French, whereby France was accusing Rwanda of hiding this man and not bringing him out. Yep. Unfortunately, um, it was, they were also accused for speaking a little bit too late because when this uh, Holocaust was happening in Rwanda, France had very little to say. After a million people died, France then uh, spoke up and said, okay, well, this is one of the gentlemen that we know did a lot of wrong in, in Rwanda. Rwanda, we're asking you to give him up, all right? And uh, I think Paul Kagame was vocal without any kind of shyness or vagary and said, look, you have no right to speak now. And even if we were, even if at some point we were hiding this man, you have no right to speak because when things went really awry, you were nowhere. So there was a lot of uh, diplomatic push and pull. So wait, France, Ugly. France was accusing Rwanda of hiding Kabuga. Yes, they did on very many occasions. And the and Paul Kagame administration yes. of hiding Felician Kabuga. There you go. It sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, um, we had Kenyan authorities at that time um, who were also accused of hiding of Kabuga hiding. In, in certain parts of Nairobi where mm. people... Um, and then there was a story that arose at some point that there was a gentleman who was identified as Kabuga, but was not him. He looked mm -hmm. like him, but he wasn't him. But uh, we don't know if it's fact, but it was alleged that uh, he was in cahoots with even a current sitting member of parliament in Kenya, bought quite a number of property. His children were in private school here in Kenya. So Kenya welcomed him. Not that they gave him a throne to sit on, but didn't either didn't exactly chase him away. They looked the other way. Right? Mm -hmm. Looked the other way when he was doing his business. So he was here for a number of years. We don't know at what juncture he left Kenya and then went to France. But I think it's very interesting that Kabuga was found in Paris, in the same country where the leaders not once, not twice, accused other countries of harboring him. And then he was found right there under okay. their noses. I think that is very interesting. Um, well, they could brag and say that we caught him. Or uh, they could be accused here. and say, well, you've been pointing fingers and he's right under your nose. Mm -hmm.
So, I mean, <laughs> it could have been many things that could have been said at this point. Um, the capture of Kabuga for me, um, in this case, is a lot of vindication for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. There's vindication for individuals. There's vindication for countries. At the same time, and I think most importantly, there is redemption, vindication, freedom for the thousands, millions of lives that were lost at his command. Mm -hmm. Whether it was through radio, whether it was through this vicious militia that was used, uh, whether it was through television. Um, those lives that were lost somebody now is being brought to book whether he's going to pay for it as an octogenarian because there's, there, there's very little left of his life um, in terms of his years here on earth mm -hmm. however he's been captured what will be done however long the cases will take um, there are some people who are rejoicing at this point mm. uh, because now um, justice might be served the French can brag. They caught an international fugitive this time uh, without any death to their officers. Mm. Remember Carlos the Jackal? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> an attempt to arrest him many years ago mm. in Paris ended up with the, the death of some French officials. But now here they are. They can say, well, um, we tracked him very well. Mm. We finally arrested him. Mm. We've been trying to warn other countries where we knew he was hiding. That this man is here. That this man is here. But those countries were refusing to cooperate with us. Uh, this is a, a, a lot is being said about Europol, Interpol and all the other international agencies and how they tracked him down and looking back at and that's why I started by saying at 85 Felician Kabuga could have said all right guys tired of this okay Here I am mm -hmm. Sawa what let's strike a deal what do you want mm -hmm. okay come for me get all the news publicity that you want come mm -hmm. for me get me now but that's just it's based on absolutely nothing it's just one of those things that you call a hunch. Hmm. I'm, I'm not basing this argument on anything at all. <laughs> just, just a hunch. Just to be clear. Just a hunch. Yeah, just a hunch. <laughs> yeah. Why arrest him now? How 26 years on the run, one man on the run, and this is not even a man who you can say had military training. You know, people who could, you could say this is a terrorist who has had military training, who thinks very well about hiding and t t taking cover and changing identity and all those things. No, this is mm -hmm. an ordinary businessman. This was an ordinary man who felt Farmer. that there were certain injustices that were done against his people and then was able to fuel this passion that he had for something to be done about the status quo with money. Wow. He was a farmer and he had money and this was going to be able to fuel his passion. And that is what he was able to use it to do. Unfortunately, millions of lives. And look, we don't even want to recount the, the horror that was meted upon people mm. and what he used people to do. The journalists that he used in the, in, 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 at the radio station, the journalists that he used, some of them have been accused and are languishing in jail today. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Uh, he was free. But he had this tool, which if we want to look at it very carefully, a lot of people are going in that direction. He had this tool called money and he was able to use it to buy these dangerous tools that people then would use and later people. on. I and mean, convince people. I mean, he was... <laughs> The or fact that it was happening in this lifetime, eh? yeah, mm -hmm. it's, and it's completely, I mean, it, you, you can't crazy. even imagine. And like you said, he wasn't any kind of intelligence force. He was not an army official. He was, uh, he was just an influential man because of the fact that he had money. Mm -hmm. And look at what he was able to do. And for, for him to have escaped all these dragnets for all those years just means to me that he had um, an extensive network of mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. that covered up for him that facilitated his escape here and there because i mean if you're let's say moving from kigali to nairobi to paris to belgium switzerland wherever it is mm -hmm. those are so many points in which you, you could have been thought. nabbed yeah. so for him to have escaped being nabbed at all of those points for him to have not been identified by anyone means he was there was somebody there who was making sure or somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody he in had there. hired a good team yes they were making sure that <laughs> he is not seen in broad daylight mm. yeah he well, hired even a if good he was seen in broad team, daylight somebody was paid to look in the other direction yes. mm -hmm. in very many occasions and i'm sure it, he wasn't dealing with those people directly he, he must have had people here that of he course. trusted who had sworn to protect him mm. right and they must have been paid very well or he must have maybe the same way he was able to convince uh, the population in rwanda to uh, launch these attacks it's the same kind of that's the kind of person that he is mm -hmm. he's able to convert you he's able to actually make you feel and believe that mm -hmm. you ought to work for him and you ought to protect him and you ought to do everything that you can mm -hmm. in your power 
I would say his power of persuasion was actually quite great. In, in then what he was able to do. You can imagine by the time somebody gets into your psyche, mm -hmm. right? To the point whereby you believe that what you're saying mm -hmm. actually makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or you believe that what you're saying actually makes, is, is the truth. Mm -hmm. um, by virtue of the fact that he was able to, I mean, we saw stories and we read stories of how he would purchase machetes or give the order for machetes to be purchased or give the order to, I mean, one of the f famous um, generals that he used was a woman. And what did she do? She was able to give the order for thousands of other women to be raped at will by the entire Hamway, by virtue of the fact that he opened his mouth. So you can imagine mm -hmm. the powers of persuasion that he held at mm -hmm. his chest, that he was able to do that. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's incredible to, to even fa fathom mm -hmm. wh wh how <laughs> that could have been. Mm -hmm. So, so will, will everyone within that um, network be nabbed? Because everyone that has facilitated, everyone that has hidden him, everyone that has looked away, will this capture then mean all of these people will be rounded up mm. in all these countries where they are? It's interesting because the people under him, quite a number of the people under him that he gave the order, have already been arrested. The small fish, the, so yeah. to speak. Mm -hmm. the people, they're just the ones who carried out the order. But the mastermind behind, that's why his story was so... Or what, that's why he, this story is so big. Because he actually was the mastermind behind a lot of the terror that we saw. Mm -hmm. And um, it's likely, just like Eric was saying, that at this point he's thinking, all right, I'm 85 years old. Uh, there's very little more than I'm going to be able to do. Mm -hmm. So other folks that I might pull into will just be collateral damage, mm -hmm. right? And okay, so if I'm, I'm, I'm going down, what else do they need to know? I'm going to give it to them. I'll give it to them. So at half past seven, let's take a look at traffic and then we come out of this. We'll still continue talking about Felicia and Kabuga and the Rwanda genocide and the suspects and what has happened to them. We'll be speaking to one of the journalists who's uh, followed this story in recent years. And this is John Alan Namu, the co-founder of Africa Uncensored. Felicia and Kabuga, one of Rwanda's richest men in the early 90s, who is accused of um, orchestrating and funding the genocide in 1994. He was arrested over the weekend in Paris mm -hmm. after... 26 years on the run accused of being in the country and it's been said that he was also in the drc in other european capitals for all those years back and forth it even led to the death of a kenyan who had apparently uh, worked to lure the business money into some meeting in Karen, and it said that the man was killed by a hit squad one of the journalists who covered this story uh, who has followed up the story of felician kabuga the allegations of felician kabuga is in the country the allegations that he's being hidden by um, some prominent people in the government is John Alan Namu. And uh, one of the stories that he did was on, you know, following up on Felician Kabuga. John Alan Namu, good morning. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Du. Good morning, Dr. Correa. Good, good morning, John. Mm -hmm. John, so Felician Kabuga, he's been arrested. Yes. Yes. How, how did you feel, actually, when you heard that the man has been arrested? Um, Did you say that you, you'd like to see his image for you to believe? <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. For sure. I mean, that was one of the first things. When, I, when, when the news came through, mm -hmm. I looked. Um, I think it was my wife who broke it to me mm -hmm. or the other way around. Um, but but I looked through multiple sources and um, then now some of my contacts, some of my old con contacts just started, you know, WhatsApping me mm -hmm. um, yeah, to confirm yeah, but uh, it was okay. Well, you know, it's it's not really my place to sort of like share my own emotional feelings about it mm -hmm. because you know I'm 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 not a victim of the genocide. I'm yeah. not a I'm not I'm not one of the victims who matter. But nonetheless, it was a relief to us, mm -hmm. you know, to have heard it. Mm -hmm. I, I would say a little bit differently, John. I think it. I think you do matter because I think you try to unveil a number of truths about what was going on for people then who didn't have an idea, but were still yeah. so closely tied to this. Because if you want to look at people who fled from Rwanda, they came to Kenya. People who fled from Rwanda mm -hmm. went to DRC, went to France, went to so many different places. And mm -hmm. then for you, look, you... You, you disappeared for some time and you had to take your family into hiding. I mean, and that was something that was public knowledge, right? But yeah. uh, if you want to then look at the story and how it has unfolded over the last 26 years, who do you <coughs> think, uh, now that he's been captured, is really free? Who, who do we think, who do, who we do think I think is, is free? free because of his capture? Oh, well, um, 
lots of people. Mm. I'd say I'd say perhaps the people who who he was funding, members of the Interahamwe who perhaps felt differently about what they had done after the fact and perhaps now want to come out and say exactly what happened. You know, one of the heads of the Interahamwe was arrested in 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, there's those people. I mean, then, of course, the, my first thoughts are with the people who were victimized mm. by the actions of, of Felicia and Kabuga. Those are the people who truly are now you know, free again to, like I said in the the, the reflection that I wrote, mm-hmm. free again to hope that, you know, justice actually doesn't have a sell-by date. Justice prevails mm-hmm. no matter how long it takes. Uh, and people people seem to think that Kabuga is the first person who was arrested after many, many years mm-hmm. on the run. Mm-hmm. He's not. Mm-hmm. But why Kabuga's case is special is because he did this. He was able to stay free with the connivance of very, very big heavy hitters across the world. Not not just in Kenya, mm. but across the world. Mm-hmm. Expand on that. Yeah. Okay. So let me give you the example of what happens in, in Kenya. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so Kabuga came to Kenya somewhere around July nineteen ninety four. Mm. This was after travelling to Switzerland. The Swiss at the time at the time mm-hmm. um rejected him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, 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 from from what we're hearing later, they they weren't you know they were they he was able to get through that territory. But anyway, he comes back from from Switzerland, mm-hmm. comes mm-hmm. to Kenya. Um, he, I'm trying to remember from my files. Um, I think he had a, 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 a I can't remember the, the the classification of his passport, but it was a it was a good classification. Yeah, mm-hmm. he sets up businesses here. He buys property here. I think all of us know about Spanish villas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so the Spanish villas there in Hurlingham, um, there were a couple of other apartments, right? Mm-hmm. He sets up nicely, like mm-hmm. properly, you know. And openly or? Him, or, or uh, openly. Uh, openly. At the time, it was open because mm-hmm. this was before the arrest warrant was issued. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he sets up openly, puts his children in school. Mm-hmm. He starts to, you know, prepare to lead a quiet life as a foreign investor in this country. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the penny drops. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, the arrest warrant is issued. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember, Kenya initially was reluctant to help Rwanda, given the, the, the close relationship that President Moy and uh, the, the, the juvenile Javi Arimana had. Mm-hmm. Um, but this then changed with operation naki mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so kabuga gets arrested he's taken to kilimani police station mm-hmm. where he spends a week mm-hmm. but a number of uh, senior kenyans i won't name them because the, the their names are in the joint task force report if anybody wants to look it up yeah mm-hmm. yeah um so a number of very senior kenyans go and start bargaining for his release he's released Mm-hmm. Yeah. So by senior um, by senior do you mean political senior or civil service senior? Both. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there were senior politicians, um people in the civil service, um very you know, high flying lawyers mm-hmm. who went to his aid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So at the time of Operation Naki, when a number of of, uh, of Rwandan uh, genocidiers were arrested in Kenya, mm-hmm. um he he then is able to bargain for his release for his release yeah mm-hmm. yeah and then he's he supposedly leaves the country but we all know that's not true right. from mm-hmm. bank records um that that he he had bank accounts at barclays mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i think he had bank accounts at uh, the cba mm-hmm. um and those were bank accounts were being operated you know remember at the time there was no electronic banking yeah. so mm-hmm. those bank accounts were being operated by who by Locally, him. yeah mm-hmm. yeah what he then goes on to do is starts to register businesses under pseudonyms oh, and right. then starts to move some of his assets to his children mm-hmm. um who his children his son-in-law who then now start to operate on his behalf so that he can live, you know, quietly. Right. Mm. But as the news starts to tighten and um, he starts to fall out of favor with uh, people, specifically after the end 
of the Moi regime, mm -hmm. then now things become more difficult. And then he has to live underground, but he still was able to do it with some of the connections that he has. John, right. let me take you back to that one week where he was arrested and he was at Kilimani police station. Yeah. Um, officially, what was happening? What was happening during that one week period? Officially. Okay. So officially during that time, um, the, the arrest warrants had started to be issued um, by the, the the Rwandan, not the Rwandan government, sorry, um, the tribunal. by the ICTR, yes, the International Criminal Tribunal. Mm -hmm. And now there was a lot of diplomatic pressure that was being put on Kenya and other countries in the region mm -hmm. that were hosting uh, Rwandese uh, genocideers on people who fled the country and were suspected to have perpetrated the genocide. Mm -hmm. That's what was happening. There was a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. So, so then, finally, I think Moy relented, um, and and I think he relented on the basis of some threat. Yeah. Um, globally, you know, about withholding of aid. Remember, this is 1997. Yeah. yeah. We were doing really badly economically. Yeah. Structural adjustment was happening at that time, mm -hmm. and and the government was in dire straits. Mm. Right, so Moy Moy um, used this as an opportunity, I think, to 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 sort of like clean his hands with <laughs> with, um, with a global community. Yeah, and then now the arrest started to happen, and a lot of people were arrested. Yeah, um, some big fish, some some in the middle there, but none as big as Kabuga was arrested here. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I mean, arrested for a long time. He was arrested, but then released and then released mm -hmm. yeah okay now there was a gentleman who had been um uh, mistaken for felicin mm -hmm. what was the story yeah. there um so you know he's he's escaped the noose a number of times there was a professor who was mistaken uh, to have been kabuga yeah um, and a few other people, but I'm guessing the person that you're talking about was the one in my story. The story that, that you did, yes. Yes. So, at the time, I didn't know what had happened, mm. right? Um, but with tracking back to how close it would appear I was, mm. um, my belief is that there are some people within the cabal of his protectors. Yeah. Mm -hmm who were able to access some of my sources, mm -hmm. put pressure on them to to give me some bad information. Mm -hmm. Because essentially the photograph was one of the last things that I received before, you know, some of my sources had to go underground. Uh, mm -hmm. So you started by, um, when you yeah. started digging up this story, you had sources that were telling you, of course, your story had, uh, you know, some GS, former GSU officers, security agents who were telling you, we actually protected this man. Yes, well, the the people who I was speaking to mm. weren't in the protection ring, but they knew they knew the people who were there. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and they knew the story. They had some of the proof. Okay, um, yeah, and that's how it went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, just just again to say here, um, I don't think there's any journalist worth his salt who would go out to try and you know, and shame a person, yeah. a living person, mm -hmm. who they know is not, you know, the person that they're looking for. True. Mm -hmm. and, and expect to get away with it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, that that was something that blindsided me when it came out. Yeah. I won't mm -hmm. lie. Mm -hmm. you know, it's something that um, I feel, you know, terribly sorry over. Yeah. But the intention behind it was not in any way to cause any grief or shame to Mr. Ngera and his family, even though um, that's what it, it did in mm -hmm. the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So, John, if we fast forward 26, well, okay, look, if we fast forward 10 years even, 15 years from when it was alleged that uh, Kabuga was hiding yeah. in Kenya, and now we see this arrest having happened in Paris. Um, yes. Yeah. Maybe many many would say one of the unlikely locations for him to have been found. Um, mm. In terms of the intensity of this case and the intensity yeah. of, the, of of the things that really happened under his watch um, in Rwanda, um, yeah. does it then, if we want to look on the global international scale of everything that had happened in Rwanda at that time, do we then want to say that yes, finally justice can be served on a legal uh, front, if by some way 
uh, imaginable we can even put aside what people suffered on a legal front, uh, looking at the courts and everything that have been set up since. Mm -hmm. Would we say that justice can be served or is it an old man who's given up his, his fight? I think justice can be served. Mm. Um, and this is why the evidence that Kabuga participated mm. in the in the building up of hatred mm. through his uh, newspaper and more importantly through uh, radio television livre de milkoling mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um what is is there you know it's there in public for all to see mm -hmm. right he wasn't doing it privately mm -hmm. kabuga was part of the akazu the yes. akazu was like the kitchen cabinet of uh, president javier imana's um, you know court mm -hmm. uh -huh. and the people who are there, majority of them have been pinned down for the genocide, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Um, there have been dozens of people who've come and testified about Kabuga's role. Mm -hmm. So the evidence exists. Mm -hmm. To say that um, a, an old man should be excused because he's an old man mm -hmm. is, is to deny the fact that this old man is a living, breathing example of the kinds of things that we should never do right. as, a, as humanity, yeah. mm -hmm. right? I think people forget that and say that because he's frail, we should forgive him. Right. Mm -hmm. what, you know, what of the families yeah. who lost loved ones? Mm -hmm. What of the families who are completely eliminated? Mm -hmm. What of mm -hmm. William Munuha's family here, who mm -hmm. for 17 years have been searching for the truth? Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Josephat Gishuki, uh, Munuha's brother, has gone to every office in this country mm. he's gone to the dpps he's gone to the attorney generals he's gone to the office of the president two presidents mm -hmm. not just not just uh, mm -hmm. not just um, one mm -hmm. right the closest he's got is a letter from the dpp saying that there should be an official inquest but yeah. this is 17 years down the line his mm -hmm. father has died mm -hmm. yeah should we then let Ka uh, kabuga rest because he's uh, he's old absolutely not no you see, so that, that, that's the thing about justice. I mean, you know, you know what Martin Luther says, right? The, mm. most, the moral arc, arc is, ro is long, mm. but it bends towards justice. justice. Yep. And like I said at the, at the top of this interview, there's lots of other examples of people who are old but were arrested yeah. and were taken mm -hmm. through the court system. Like uh, Demnyanyuk, the Polish uh, prison officer yeah. mm. uh, who was arrested first taken to Israel, acquitted, and then arrested again and taken to Germany where he died. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's, there's precedent in being able to try people of his age. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much about his age, but about the weight of the crimes that mm -hmm. he committed. Mm -hmm. What do you make of these arrests now? 26 years later, the man is arrested at an apartment in France. After so many years of evading justice and evading arrest, and like you said, he seems to have had uh, a cabal working around him to ensure his safety. What do you make of this now? I think it's been, it's, it's a lot of effort that the mechanism that, you know, that have been investigating the crimes in Rwanda have, have made mm -hmm. to be able to get this close. Um, I've been in touch with people from that m mechanism over the years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, even before I did the Kabuga story. Um, because I was interested in what was happening in Rwanda and had done a couple of stories at KTN mm. while I was at KTN. Mm -hmm. the, the determination of some of these guys to be able to get the officers, to me, honestly, was unparalleled. Mm. Okay. Right? Yeah, because mm. it, it, there'd be an officer who gets in touch, then a couple of years later, a new lead comes out, they get in touch, mm -hmm. they want to recheck something that, that, you know, that happened, they'll call and get in touch and ask me some questions right mm -hmm. you know um so it speaks to the determination of of a few people who know that their job matters right mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but i think on the on the on, on the more architectural scale of this of the crimes that he committed but more so being able to evade justice for 26 years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think the search for justice also continues by finding the people who helped hide him. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I was going to so ask you if yes. if this um, net should nab mm -hmm. everyone who's been an accomplice or complicit in any way uh, now mm -hmm. that this guy has been found mm -hmm. and arrested. Well, yeah, I think what's going to happen is that he's going to be tried at the International Criminal 
court for his crimes. Mm -hmm. But it, nothing stops any other uh, jurisdiction in which he's been from opening up a new case, you know, using the allegations that, that um, have been filed against him to say, okay, well, how did you get here? Mm -hmm. You know, who was protecting you? What happened? And, mm -hmm. and that, I think, is, is also the wider story of, of uh, Kabuga's uh, being a fugitive, mm -hmm. right? He was in Kenya. Mm -hmm. He was in the, in the DRC. He was, I think, I believe in Belgium and then also yeah. in, in France, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? For the people who are saying that uh, now Kenya is off the hook because he was arrested in France, I'm missing the point, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Kabuga was one of the richest men in that country, mm. right? He had the ear of the president, the president's wife, right? Mm -hmm. um, if I believe, if I believe, I'll, I'd have to go and check my facts, but one of his relatives was actually married into the, into the, the first family mm -hmm. or had a close relationship, yeah? Mm -hmm. Meaning that you'd also have international ties. Yeah, contact, mm -hmm. yes. Remember how close the French governments were to uh, francophone countries yeah. in yeah. Africa, mm -hmm. right? So the Francois Mitterrand government and the Jacques Chirac government, the officials there who would have to answer for how mm -hmm. genocidias, because Kabuga is not the only one, mm -hmm. uh, how genocidias would keep getting into that territory, yeah. mm -hmm. right? I think this is also the, the product of a much better relationship between France and Rwanda. Mm -hmm. The Macron and and the Kagame government have had some rapp rapprochement in, in recent years. Mm. And I think this is what this is. Is the result of it. People, exactly. People are now willing to talk. But when you talk about but widening the net, John, yeah. but when you talk about widening the net to other countries to look at um, the networks that helped him evade justice, I think that's opening up a political can of worms. I personally, I don't see it happening. Because yeah, uh, neither do I. No, but, no country but, will, uh, no, yeah. no president or any leader will want to look back at those bygones. The man has been arrested. Let's just forget it. Mm -hmm. because, well, uh, look, 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 um, uh, Eric. Mm. Nobody thought that the French government would cooperate this so closely. Mm -hmm. Like a couple of years ago, and you remember when uh, Rwanda's uh, foreign minister does an, an arrest warrant issued for her, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Nobody thought that a relationship that sour would be on the mend, mm -hmm. right? Why this case is interesting is because it shows that in spite of everything that we've believed and analyzed, mm -hmm. because a lot of people had kind of given up and thought, yeah. Look, this man is dead, mm -hmm. right? Um in spite of all we've believed and, and analyzed, this has happened. Who tells you that a president would be able to, you know, elected in Kenya, for instance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My own wishful thinking, who says, you know, <laughs> what we, actually have, we, we actually have a lot of historical baggage that we need to get through, including obligations to our neighbors mm -hmm. to figure out what exactly happened, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's this president for countries that have been complicit in crimes um, in the past, helping mm. others in the, you know, in the present, mm. right? If you look at the entire history of the Holocaust, the people who perpetrated the Holocaust, a lot of them fled those countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was through the, those kinds of agreements that people were say, able to say, okay, now we shall analyze how you got here and take you back. So it's a huge can of worms. I don't disagree. And in the short term, I don't think that there'd be any country brave enough to say, not least Kenya, to say, okay, let, let us open up the books of our past and see how this guy got here. Mm. And also, you know, help the people who are his handlers here, whether they are big or they are small. Mm. In the short term, mm. I don't see it happening, but maybe in the future it does, because there's no sell by date on justice. And remember, murder does not have a statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. Well, there you go. John, you alluded to the fact that obviously there were frosty relations um, between Rwanda and France, um, specifically with the Kagame administration. Um, now a number of French presidents have gone through, but now with Macron in place, do you see that uh, those relations can thaw out now with this arrest, with what would be seen as the cooperation um, uh, to bring somebody who caused such drama in Rwanda to book? 
Well, I, I don't want to speak for anyone in Rwanda, any official in Rwanda, much less the president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this would definitely be a big thing. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knows the significance of, of Kabuga, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? Not least Kagame, who was fighting the people um, who Kabuga was supporting. Uh, it would be a very, very big sort of carrot to dangle for Rwanda and French uh, and the France. Uh, sorry, and uh, it's early in the morning, so my vocabulary. <laughs> uh, it it would be a big carrot for Rwanda and France to you know be dangled in front of them mm -hmm. to then now come back and improve their cooperation because. Mm -hmm. You know, even before the genocide, there are a lot of Rwandese people who fled mm -hmm. to, to France and have lived lives there and have connections there mm -hmm. because there were there were three similar incidents, none as big as ninety four, but mm -hmm. you know there was fifty nine, there was seventy three, I believe, and then ninety four. So Rwanda has suffered many many times, and its citizens have suffered many times, and yeah. many of them have gone to France mm -hmm. to seek refuge. So if only for those relationships, mm. right, I, I'd say that this would be a big opportunity. But again, I can't speak for any anybody from Rwanda. Right. Um, but this is what I'd, I'd say. Mm -hmm. John, what's the status of the ICTR? Was it disbanded? Is it still sitting? What What's happening? So what happened with the ICTR is sometime, I believe in 2011, 2012, mm. they began to wind it up right yep. but what what then the ICTR became is now the MICT so the mechanism for the international criminal tribunal mm -hmm. right and so what the mechanism would do is that it investigates cases of genocideers and then the cases that it's able to bring now for instance with Kabuga would then be referred to the international criminal court okay yeah, so the ICTR, as we knew it, wound down um, somewhere between 2011 and 2014. Mm. So the mechanism yeah. now is like the um, a, an investigative arm exactly. of what happened in Rwanda. And all yeah. cases are then pro taken over by the prosecutor of the ICC. Yes, but you know that the, the MICT is also headed by a, a former prosecutor of one of these tribunals. His name is Serge Bramat. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'd say that uh, Bramat would have a role in, in the prosecution. prosecuting, in the prosecution. Mm. Okay. Yeah. John Alandamu, we want to thank you very much for speaking to us. Oh, Dr. Marcy, did you have one final question? No, no. For All right. Mm -hmm. John Alan, thank you very much for speaking to us. Uh, All I, right. Thank I, you, guys. I know when you, when you had this story come out, you are one of those people who immediately uh, started looking back into your files and remembering yeah. what you'd covered on uh, Felicia and Kabuga. Yeah, for sure. I mean, weirdly enough, sorry, I know we're winding up, but yep. in 2019, there were at least three occasions where I'd had occasion to look back into the file. That's why some of the things that I'm talking about are so fresh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, this definitely, like, closes a chapter for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so yeah. much, John. Thank you, Thank and you, keep John. doing the good work Thank with you. African Censored. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, the man is... Uh, has finally gotten held by the long arm of the law, the long arm of justice. Let's see how now the next stages unfold at the ICC. Um, when will he ever even uh, actually sit at the ICC? When will he ever get convicted, if at all? Or when will the trial even begin, if at all? You know, all these things are still right up there in the air.